Everybody, welcome to this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. I'm Montel Williams, and I'm telling you, I'm so excited to have our guest on today. My guest is an international writer for High Times, Dope Magazine, World Weed, and several other outlets. She's been touted as one of the most prolific and really informative writers in the entire cannabis space in the world today. Little did she know how important her work in the cannabis field would become to her personally. Well, let's find out what it did. Please welcome Sharon Letts. Thanks so much for joining us today, Sharon. Hi, Montel. So happy to be here. Absolutely. For a lot of people who don't know anything about you at all, let's back up and tell them a little bit about your background and uh, as a TV host, as a producer, and how you really got involved in the cannabis space. Let's start beforehand. You started literally in Southern California working for like a local cable company, correct? Well, I started on television in local access. I had a gardening show. I was a gardener for 17 years at Flower Beds. So I ended up in Los Angeles as a field and segment producer of documentary and magazine shows. And then I was brought up to Humboldt County in Northern California to produce a news show. Little did I know that was the cannabis capital of the world. So when you got up there first, you you were just gonna go up to Humboldt just to do straight up news. But then what made you gravitate to the cannabis space? Well, while I was in media, I ended up being lead feature writer at the Time Standard in Eureka. And so everyone knew me. And I ended up presenting with lobular carcinoma, which is a breast cancer. And uh, it's a spider web uh, mass that only 10% of all women in the U.S. get. And because I was known, um, Pearl Moon, a Southern Humboldt, longtime farmer and medicine maker, brought me the cannabis oil. And I was in mainstream media. My first question to her was many people's first question, if this works, why don't I know about it, right? So the first night I took the oil, I didn't need a sleeping pill. The next day, I didn't need a painkiller. Two and a half weeks, all my pharmaceuticals were gone. Two and a half months, the the cancer was gone with no chemo or surgery. So I I like to say it was as if God (laughs) took me with a voice from Los Angeles, dropped me in Humboldt County and gave me cancer. And, uh, And I've used my voice ever since for the past eight years to tell stories of healing. Well, let's stop for a second and go back to that, you know, first initial diagnosis. Come on, you had to have been shocked, correct? Did you have a family history of uh, breast cancer? Um, I'm second generation DDT off my grandmother's farm from Illinois. My sister had the same exact uh, cancer, lobular, three years prior, went through surgery, uh, you know, partial mastectomy, chemo, follow-up radiation, suffered for about three years. So, um, yeah, I was prepared for all that. Um, everyone from my grandma's farm died of cancers. Um, you know, we have a lot of issues from on the spectrum from DDT. That's a theory. Um, so, yeah, I was prepared for that. When I took the oil the first night and it replaced my sleeping pill, it was shocking. That's a multi-billion dollar industry in the U.S. Well, hold on, slow down for a second. So when you got diagnosed, of course, you were seeing a regular oncologist, a standard oncologist. No. Um, back up a bit. When I first, uh, the first ultrasound and mammogram, you could see the white spider web. It's obvious. It's not like a tumor that could be mistaken as a cyst. It's the real deal. You know what it is. So um, I scheduled the first biopsy. I started uh, juicing leaf because uh, Dr. Uh, William Courtney from Mendocino had my ear when I was at the time standard about how juicing leaf puts many things into remission, including, you know, MS. I've written about this. And uh, so I started juicing leaves. So when the first biopsy rolled around, part of the mass was gone and I had done nothing but the leaf. So I made a uh, bartered with the oncologist um, for six more weeks, six to eight more weeks. And so six more weeks before you did surgery? No, before we scheduled another biopsy. I didn't have the biopsy done. I made a deal. Excuse me. I made a deal that I wanted to start this oil. I said, if the leaf just took part of the mass away, I don't want to have the biopsy. I want to do this oil. Let's see if it goes away. So in six to eight weeks, when the second biopsy was scheduled, the mass was completely gone. There was no place for a biopsy. There was only scar tissue left. So um, because I haven't been diagnosed or wasn't diagnosed, I'm now part of a 30-year study with the American Cancer Society on prevention. And I've corresponded with the director 
Dr. Patel, and she's promised to include more and more um, questions relative to me. Because when I started doing the questionnaire, it wasn't relative. But now, again, to say, first off, you came back, was it positive for you know, lobular carcinoma? Well, it was never diagnosed because I made it, it disappeared with the cannabis oil. So I wasn't diagnosed. The oncologist knew it was lobular because if you Google lobular carcinoma, it's a distinct white spider web mass in the breast. So we all knew that's what it was. We all knew it was there. The oil made it go away. And all my prescription meds went away. And that first cannabis oil that you were using, what, what was the oil itself? Was it high in CBD? Was it, you know, just a regular tincture? What, what was it? Yeah, it was what people refer to as Rick Simpson oil. That's an honorary title. Um, it's actually an alcohol reduction. It's a strong, it measures in an 80 to 90% activated THC because we know that THC is the compound that kills cancer cells. So it was an alcohol reduction. It was made from what's called a salad. Um, as we know now, cultivars, or what we used to call strains, are inconsistent. So medicine makers now that are making the oil for serious ailments are using a variety of cultivars, what we call a salad. Because what you really want is that high, uh, full terpene and cannabinoid profile. And we get that using many different cultivars um, in, a, in the oil. And so that's the original the oil you were ingesting? Were you... Um... I did. I ingested it. She handed it to me in a jar, said, take a toothpick to take small amounts. It was very rudimentary. This was, you know, eight years ago. I knew nothing. Now, today we know if you do suppositories, there's no head high. So I slept a lot um, while I took it. It was very, very strong. I'm already used to THC, so that was a roadblock that was okay for me. A lot of people, it's hard for them. That's suppositories now. Okay. So now, what, what did your doctor say? when you then you know, came back the second uh, attempt at a biopsy and there was no cancer there? Well, this is the, the gift and the miracle of the whole thing because I was in Humboldt County. Um, my MD saw farmers. She knew they used cannabis. She didn't know how to talk to them. My oncologist, same thing. He was a Humboldt County oncologist, kind of heard about cannabis and cancer, but had no idea. So I physically taught my MD I physically taught my oncologist and he was amazed. They were all amazed. The technician said, well, it must be a technical error. The six month follow-up I received said, well, there's scar tissue there. So you must have had pr prior surgery, but I never had prior surgery. So the, the scar tissue is still there, it's still showing. So the cancer has not returned in what now, eight years? Eight years. And no pharmaceutical sense, cannabis. And then I like to say cannabis was my gateway uh, to other beneficial herbs because since then I've added chamomile, which is good for depression and calming and anxiety and depression, you know, and uh, several other herbs I've added. A lot of superfoods I've added. Cannabis is a superfood. And now, so now you've now made it your life's mission to write about, discuss, and talk about this now in every forum that you can. Is that right? Yeah, the journey was not my own, you know, I mean, I, I was led here, it wasn't, it wasn't a plan, <laughs> you know, you don't, mainstream media, I, I had a living wage, I was respected, you know, I was, uh, it's different in the cannabis space, as you know, Montel, I'm sure, the dim discrimination is there, you know. It's a bit well, you know so, so you came out of, you know, this, this, this bout with cancer, you were still a mainstream producer, what then transitioned you over to? Was it just the fact that you wanted to tell your story and then you started looking for outlets to tell your story? Is that how you became a writer in focusing on cannabis? Well, initially I thought, great, I'm just going to write this for all the outlets I've already been writing for, but no, no one wanted it. You know, they still can't. As long as it's on Schedule 1 and the U.S. government says it's not medicine, mm -hmm. I can't write patient, I write patient profiles. My focus is patient profiles, whether I'm interviewing a celebrity or someone in the industry or anything, they all have to have a relationship to the plant. So these stories are called anecdotal. They mainstream won't run them. So this is, you know, why I write for the weed magazine. But I mean, you're, you're a person, as a writer, you, you also then understand and know that our federal government issued itself a patent on 
cannabis back in 2002. And in that patent, in their abstract, they discuss openly what they felt or feel the medicinal benefits are of cannabis. So when you say you can't write about it because the government says it's not a medicine, this is a discussion I was having a couple of days ago. It's just bizarre that, you know, we have a whole group of scientists who are right now trying to get the DEA to deschedule, to deschedule cannabis from being a Schedule One drug because their own other governmental office has already stated that that scheduling of Schedule One is inappropriate because it is a true medicine. Yep, it's a, it's a, it's crazy making. It really is crazy making. And, you know, I was in mainstream media. This happened to me. And that was only the tip of the iceberg on the misinformation and flat out lies from the U.S. government on many things, not just Canada. So as a mainstream media person, it was an eye opener, you know. So now that was eight years ago when this journey began for you. And let's talk about what's happened in the last eight years. Well, um, as I said, I've focused on patient profiles. I wrote for Dope Magazine for three years. They, I did a road trip series for them where I traveled all over the world, three countries, six states. Um, I continue to travel when I can. This past year, I had the brakes put on me, but I was asked uh, a couple of weeks ago to be a judge in Mexico's second cannabis cup. Uh, the Senate here is pending approving adult use and medical use for the country. And, but the industry has already started. I mean, we already have packaged products and testing and private clubs and dispensaries all over Mexico now. It's interesting to me because, you know, I call myself a legally healed, you know, that's a phrase we've heard before. Um, the healing happens before legislation. The healing happens before education. When a state legalizes for cannabis, um, <clears throat> that doesn't mean more people are getting high. It means that they, it means that that medible, that edible taken to get high is going to turn into an aid, a medible really fast. It's going to become medicine for them. If they have sleeping problems and they take a edible at night, you know, to party or whatever, they're going to have the best sleep of their night of their life that night. So the healing happens regardless. We're just waiting for legislation to catch up. And where, where are you coming to me from right now? Are you in Mexico, you said? I live in Mexico now because I work full time writing for cannabis magazines. <laughs> I can't afford to live in the States. Yeah. Gotcha. And, yeah. And I've come full circle back to television. I've actively been developing shows from the series I write. Because I was a documentarian, I graduated, I just um, went into series for magazines. So I do series, my higher profiles for high times, uh, what's in your stash which was a sneaky way for me to do a patient profile for a, you know, a magazine known for recreation. Uh, when you look at someone's stash, you're looking at how they medicate and why. And I, everyone I interview has to have a relationship with the plant and they have to understand what I call medicating to recreate. And I like to say, you know, your endocannabinoid system doesn't care about you just wanting to get high. Your body is receiving the benefit. Correct. And I've, I've been saying all along, I believe that you know, anybody who gravitates towards cannabis, even recreationally or as an adult use option, is is gravitating that way because they have some sort of underlying medical issue, even if they don't want to admit to it. You know? I've heard you say this in your interviews. I you know I've interviewed many people that you've interviewed, Jim Belushi, um, Alex Todd, all these people. Yeah. And it's true. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, because I think a lot education. of education, it's just education. That's what's so sadly missing in this industry, I think, worldwide. Uh, talk a little bit about what's going on in Mexico. I mean, Mexico has been, you know, um, you know, on the, the, the I don't call it the bad side in a sense in the last 30 years. I mean, you know, our government has done everything it could do to try to stop cannabis trade through Mexico into the United States. And often uses Mexico as the villain in cannabis. You know, as a matter of fact, the, the only reason why the term marijuana was ever used was because it was a term used in the turn of the century to represent Mexican prostitutes. So that's how we came up with the term marijuana, you know, which was really ignorant. And the fact that people even use the term today is just blows my mind. But what's, what's going on in Mexico? 
right now when it comes to cannabis? Um, well, you know, we can blame third world countries for drug problems, but it all starts with the U.S. in my mind. And that's a theory, you know, it's a rabbit hole I don't want to go down to right now. But uh, certainly the U.S. has a lot to do with uh, Mexico's drug problem. Um, when I write about the drug war, the failed drug war, I like to call it because it is, I don't say criminal, I don't say whatever, I say meeting supply and demand, because that's what it is. And um, the Sinaloa cartel, in 2009, Mexico decriminalized all drugs for personal use with small amounts listed. And they, that was their attempt. And um, the cartels retaliated at that time. There was a lot of violence, but the media in America didn't report why. They, didn't, they never said it was because we decriminalized here. They just said, you know, it's such a terrible thing down there. The reason they're legalizing is they're done with the drug war. They're done um, with the misinformation. The language, when the Supreme Court of Mexico uh, did away with prohibition uh, in 2018, October of 2018, um, we're waiting for ordinances to be put in writing now. When they did away with it, the language that they used was um, because there was no good reason to prohibit it in the first place. And that's the crux of the matter. And this is recognized by every country that's legalizing now, which there are many. And uh, that's what's happening. They want to change. And the young people coming up, the cup was sponsored by people who have connections to old school Mexico money. And the young people now want to be in a greater good industry. They want to change a lot of things. And cannabis is a good gateway for that. Now, the Sinaloa cartel in 2009 started um, planting poppies to feed America's opioid addiction. So again, it's supply and demand. And, and I'm talking about right now, what is going on in Mexico when it comes to cannabis right this minute? Have they re-legalized re, re, re it? Well, there is no prohibition as of October 2018. The Senate is meeting right now as we're speaking to put recreational adult usage rules and medicine rules in place. Activists have been camped out on the Senate building steps for almost a year now. They've planted more than 700 cannabis plants around the Senate building. Some of them are 8, 10 feet tall now. They have been holding wor educational workshops uh, to teach the people about medicine. So that's where we are right now. We're just hoping that the ordinances are good. You know, in the states, when they pass ordinances, they're not always for the people. So this is what, you know, we want to make sure people can grow here for themselves. We want to make sure medicine is available in a socialized system and adult usage. You know, we don't want people to go to jail or have to pay curb money to the policia for weed. Right now, I mean, if you were to step out your front door holding the joint in your hand and smoking it, would you get arrested right now? Or you're, it's, it's... No, it's, it's tolerated all over Mexico. Um, I live in an American community. I would say 70% of the Americans use cannabis. Um, there's products here. I mean, I've traveled all over the world. When I covered Paris, my, my essay, I wrote an American stoner in Paris. Uh, that was illegal at that time, but I still was able to score weed on the steps of the sacred core, you know? So it's everywhere. It's always everywhere. The healing happens. The, it continues to be used. It's safe to use and it's global. And like I said, we're, the healing's happening. We're just waiting for legislators to be educated. And, and are there dispensaries in Mexico or no? There are private clubs. There's a private club in Mexico City. That's a full-on dispensary. I've seen photographs. Um, there's a private club. There's private clubs in Baja Norte, where I live, Tijuana, and Sonata. Um, yeah, they're they're not uh, public. You know, they're private. But the community has been private for a long time here, as it was in the states for many years. Are they similar to like what you would see in California or in Colorado? Yeah, when I judged the cup a few weeks ago, I mean, the products are labeled. They're, they're packaged and labeled just like any dispensary in the States. We had an a engineer there with a lab set up in a hotel room that was testing everything. And uh, for, you know, we had CBD product. CBD is legal here, so there's a lot of CBD everywhere. 
Um, and even though we don't have retail ordinances, you can find CBD products in all kinds of shops all over Mexico. You can see cannabis products. It's tolerated. Gotcha. So like right now, you want to do the, who are you writing for most right this minute? High Times pays my rent. Um, Weed World UK. Uh, I've been writing for them for nine years consistently. Um, I write for all kinds of magazines all over the world. My my work's been translated into different languages. Um, yeah, I'm always writing something. My latest, can I show you? I'm so proud. My latest is Gizelle Fetterman, the second lady of Pennsylvania. For week. She's on the cover this month. She just came out of the closet because uh, Pennsylvania has a bill pending for legalization. And she heard one of the legislators dogging cannabis users. So she came out and said, well, I'm a chronic pain patient. Very proud of this one. Beautiful person. Right. She just made the news this week because of somebody, you know, casting aspersions against her in a grocery store, saying some things about her, which is really, really crazy. I'm mean, hopefully we'll get her on my podcast, I think, as soon as I can. Uh, yes, yes. So, I mean, so what do you think about, you know, what's happening in the United States right now when it comes to cannabis? I mean, I don't know if you know that uh, since, you know, the onset of COVID, cannabis has almost proven to be a recession-proof uh, commodity. I mean, a lot of the states that made an essential service and claimed it to be an essential service. So therefore, most of the dispensaries in most country states that had them already open were you know, allowed to stay open. And, and now I, there are several states that are talking about the fact that, you know, and we're getting data that proves that, you know, cannabis sales throughout this entire, entire COVID debacle have gone up. What do you think about the, with the state of cannabis in the United States? Well, I, you know, I, the COVID thing was, there was many silver linings. You know, first of all, it, it sat us down and made us think. Uh, that was good. Um, making cannabis an essential part of for the industry is awesome because it is a medicine. That was a brilliant omission. Talk about the hypocrisy of it still being on schedule one. It's, just, it's, a, it's a mess. Um, but I, I thought I had COVID beginning of March, actually. And the thing is, in the last eight years, I rarely get a cold or flu. I, my ingesting um, keeps me in homeostasis, and I'm pretty healthy. You know, I'm 61 right now, and, and I rarely get sick. So beginning of March, I thought I was getting a flu, and I thought, this is weird. And usually if I get a flu, it's only for a couple of days, um, and I up my oil intake, and it goes away. When you think about the benefits of cannabis, inflammation top of the list um there's a lot of symptoms of covid that that cannabis treats the symptoms it's just it does and I don't know what happened. pardon i was gonna say there have been a couple of articles that have been published recently talking about you know cbd and thc being you know superior anti-inflammatories and some of the anti-inflammatories that are being used right now in hospitals for covid so you're right but go ahead Hands down. And so when I started presenting with symptoms, I had, you know, the fever, the coughing, the body aches. It was bad. It scared me. And um, I started upping. I did the cannabis oil suppositories every three to four hours. And in 48 hours, my symptoms were down to mild. So I had two magazines, order stories. There's an essay in Weed World under my kitchen apothecary series I write for them with the oil recipe. And then I did another. I have to do it a series called Daily Dose for Vegas and Tahoe cannabis magazines that I did an essay in there on um, about how cannabis can help. And um, it's valid. It's very valid. It just takes education. We just need so much education and we need it to come off of schedule one and we need the government to fess up. I don't know if you've had a chance to watch uh, the recent uh, vice presidential debates, but they seem to slip past a lot of people. You know, uh, Vice President uh, to, uh, candidate uh, Kamala Harris said during the debate that she and Joe Biden intended to decriminalize cannabis if they were elected. And I was really angry when she used the term decriminalize rather than deschedule because decriminalization is not what we need. Decriminalization still makes it appear or sound as if it's something wrong with it as a drug. And it's not. So, you know, the idea of decriminalizing just means that you're relieving or loosening some of the penalties not actually taking away the stigma. What do you think about that? Absolutely agree, 100%. Now, Joe wasn't even going to have it on the list for the campaign until Kamala uh, came on board. Kamala came on board. 
So God bless her. And she's been getting some slack because she was a prosecutor in California. But you know what? I don't fault people in law enforcement. I don't fault the prosecutors. I fault the a lack of education and the legislation. So um, I'm happy that it's on their list now. I do not like decriminalization either. I agree. It has to, you know, prohibition just has to go away. The th- as I said earlier, when a state legalizes, you know, people gear up for people getting high. But that's not what happens. People end up healing. So, you know, the ordinances have to be rewritten. We have to rethink things. It's- I mean, yeah, we've seen across the board almost every single state that has put in a medical marijuana program. You've seen opioid addiction go down. You've seen teenage use go down. You've seen people literally who were, you know, just beating the Medicare and Medicaid and, and you know, the, the healthcare system into the ground for over medication of other products literally back off a little bit because now they're solving some of their issues through cannabis and not having to go spend as much time with the doctor. So I agree with you, but I think it's going to take a long time before, you know, we actually reach a spot of national homeostasis when it comes to people recognizing the viability of cannabis as a alternative. Right. I agree. I got to do something. I got to take, I got to take a little break and pay some bills and then let's come back and talk a little bit more because I'm really interested to figure out what you're, what's coming up next. What are you going to be working on soon? So let's talk a little bit about that. My guest today has been international the known writer, you know, for High Times, for Dope Magazine, for Weed Worlds, and other several other magazines. And she has uh, really been on a journey with cannabis because of her own personal need that has turned into an advocacy for so many others who need an advocate. So, again, Sharon Lett, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm going to take a little break. We'll be back right after this. Don't we'll run away. More Let's Be Blunt in just a minute. Well, thanks so much for tuning in to Let's Be Blunt with Montel today. And my guest is Miss Sharon Letts, who is an internationally known writer for magazines such as High Times, Dope, Weed World, and several others. She's been touted as one of the most prolific and informative writers in the entire cannabis space in the world. So I can't say thank you enough, Sharon, for being here with us today. Thank you for being a part of Let's Be Blunt. Thank you, Montel. I really appreciate your advocacy. No, absolutely. Thank you. I think it's, uh, you know, all of us working together. We'll get the job done eventually, I hope. Um, you know, now you've done a lot of, you know, high profile, you know, uh, uh, interviews with a lot of high profile celebrity and other people who, um, and out of all those interviews, what, what's what been some of the most interesting, well, if you want, you don't have to name names and I'm not asking you to yeah. be. No, I can name. Let's talk about some of the most interesting interviews you've done. Yeah. Um, some of the stories will be on my deathbed. I'm, you know, I'm, I keep I keep secrets for people, especially if they're celebrities. Um, but celebrities, the interviews have turned into interventions more often than not because celebrities have a big voice. Uh, they need to be educated, and so in doing the interviews, you know, sometimes if someone's just smoking and they're having sleep issues, you know, we'll talk about that. It also, you know, and then I end up helping them, and then they end up helping more people. So the celebrities have been important to me. One of my favorite celebrity interviews is um, Olivia Newton-John and her husband, John Easterling. John makes Olivia's cannabis oil. And I first heard them speaking on mainstream media, and they would say, oh, we hear you're using cannabis. And and she'd say, yeah, it helps with pain. And then John said he would go into homeostasis and how THC kills cancer cells, yada, yada. And they would never report on that. So I got in touch and I, I put her on a cover of Culture Magazine first. And then I did this one for Weed World because she actually replaced the opiates. When I interviewed her the first time, she was still on some oxy. And we talked and um, she ended up doing away with it. And then I did this article. And earlier we, we touched on the opiate situation. I've done several patient profiles where people replace opiates, fentanyl, Valium, alcohol, meth, all kinds of things with cannabis oil, kratom, chamomile, combinations of beneficial herbs. I mean, I did, I did a show, and this is really kind of crazy, but this was back maybe three years ago. I and Dr. Oz, remember Oz did a show. We were one of the first to actually do a national show on the fact that, you know, cannabis could be used as an exit drug for opioid addiction and got some, you know, scientists and doctors at, you know, local New York hospitals that, were there to actually confirm. And it's been written about now over and over and over again, because we see that, 
you know, in the states again where that have medical marijuana, you know, initiatives, opioid addiction is going down. Yep, it is. It really is. It works. And the thing is, it doesn't just, I mean, it transitions you off the drugs while dealing with the body pain of withdrawal, the nausea, uh, there's many, um, you know, the fevers, everything. It, it quells those symptoms as you transition off, making it safer for your body to go off. But the most important thing is with the plants, they treat the original symptom of whatever it was, why you got addicted in the first place, whether it's chronic pain or emotional disorders. And um, I want to say one thing. People say, this is too good to be true. How can it do MS? How can it do cancer? How can it do all these things? You know, what is this? It's like, and then they call it miraculous or a miracle. It's not a miracle. The superfoods are put on this planet for our bodies and they work with our bodies and they address all of our 11 biological symptoms, uh, systems and many, many myriad symptoms. So it's not a miracle. It's just misunderstood. And Western medicine says, take a pill when you're sick. We say use plants to not get sick. It's prevention. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, that, but, and, you know, when you take a look at cannabis, cannabis is really one of the only superfoods that you are genetically predisposed with a system in your body to actually process, which is really kind of insane. I mean, you digest all the other superfoods. You literally have a system in your body that's been made that is part of your, you know, genetic makeup when you were born that is antagonized by cannabinoids. It's called the endocannabinoid system. That's now finally being taught in colleges around the world. And finally, doctors are catching up with the fact that, yes, in fact, had they never used cannabis in their entire life, their body has cannabinoids in it. You know, and these cannabinoids are starting to figure out now that, you know, having, you know, a lack of certain levels of these cannabinoids could be what is responsible for some of the illnesses that we see. And we didn't see some of these illnesses until we started outlawing cannabis back in 1937. So people need to understand. And I think that's some of the things that you've been doing. I, I, I know you've been writing a little bit about it, but you know, I, I applaud you and any other writer who will take the time to, to explain to their readers that you yourself produce cannabinoids. Get it through your head, you and all other mammals on this planet. It's a symbiotic relationship. And beneficial plants have fragrances. The medicine is in the fragrance. The medicine is in the fragrance of the cannabis plant. It's the terpene. And beneficial plants have fragrances because we have noses. It's a symbiotic relationship that we've gone away from the garden. We we need to get back to the garden. That's that's real. Absolutely. And, you know, the terpenes, the flavonoids, all the other components of this plant. I mean, right now, we we literally only talk about consistently only talk about two cannabinoids, which is THC and CBD, but we know that there's at least 166 other cannabinoids in the plant that have the same medical viability. The guy who discovered them to begin with, Dr. Mishum, always said they work in an entourage effect. He never said they work one at a time. He always said that. He said that from day one. In research that it was paid for by the United States government, research that validated by the United States government. So it's not like this is something that's new. It's just been something that Literally, I think, you know, mainstream has tried to do away with because they thought that they were making so much more money off of textiles and pharmaceuticals when they could really have made as much money off of hemp and, and cannabis as they did with trying to create something in a laboratory. But we're coming back to that. I think we're slowly, slowly coming back. That's why I will always be a whole plant girl. I always will. The whole plant is for me. And THC, people fear. And the stigma is worse than the truth. But THC, we as a species up that, we hybridized it up to the heights today. The original, what we call the God plant, which was allegedly in the cannabis, you know, holy anointing oil, that only tested in at 4 to 5% THC. So the, the demonization of it is by our own hand, which, you know, a lot of things on this planet that are bad right now are by our own hand. And THC is one of them. The irony is, is THC is a valuable compound. Education is needed. When you medicate with cannabis, you don't have to activate the THC. THC isn't even in the plant. It's THCA and it's non-psychoactive until you eat it. So there's a lot of um, education that needs to be done. 
Absolutely. And, you know, again, most people don't know this too. There's you know, CBG, which turns into both CBD and THC. THC exactly. People, exactly. Don't, people don't understand. And I think the more and more, you know, you continue to write and continue to educate, the more and more people will start to understand and believe that, you know, this was something that should have been a part of our, you know, makeup and something that we actually, you know, again, go back before 1937, you know, the majority of people in this country ate some form of hemp seed weekly, you know, whether it was ground up and used as a, you know, coating on food or used as a cereal in the morning or a porridge, people were eating hemp seeds. And then all of a sudden it got vilified and it was vilified, had nothing to do with being vilified because it was a drug. It was vilified because of the Marijuana Tax Act. People don't get it. Right, exactly. You couldn't track the dollar. You couldn't track the seed across state lines. And even to the day, you still can't. If I could put another layer on that. The pharmaceutical industry was started in the late 1930s. It's a relatively new industry. It's an experimental industry, if you will, still. And, uh, you know, before that, we had cannabis and we had plants. And cannabis oil was actually used in surgeries by doctors in the late 1800s. It was replaced with morphine because the hypodermic needle started to be sold in the Sears and Robot catalog for home use. And cannabis oil at that time was not water soluble because of the resin. We know now how to do that. So morphine was chosen. I found letters by doctors saying, please don't take our cannabis oil away. It's not addictive. The patients have more clarity. Morphine makes them, ruins their lives. I mean, we saw this in the late 1800s. Oh, you can go back. If you go to any library across the country and pull a newspaper out of the 1800s, 1890s, you know, remember, we had just come out of something called the Civil War. We had people who were who were extremely you know disfigured and injured and hurt and you had people who survived that war you know getting their you know limbs amputated with with you know tree saws and you know people were utilizing cannabis back then and what people don't seem to want to remember you know we didn't have heat back then we didn't have air conditioning back then you didn't have a lot of people didn't have a bed to sleep on they slept on the floor or on the ground so you know we didn't have toilet paper in rolls you know you had to go out and grab so, I mean, you know, we were literally doing things that made life simpler and easier. But let's go back even further, go back to the late 1600s, go back to the early 1600s. They used hemp seeds on ships to cross the Atlantic Ocean because people ate them. We use we use hemp as, uh, you know, the, the fibers to make ropes, to make sails, to make tents. Our entire revolutionary army was clothed in hemp uniforms. So it's really ignorant that we took something that built America and destroyed it. If I could add another layer to the Civil War, I love this so much. The first Surgeon General, we didn't have a Surgeon General. The first general, medical general for the United States government was named right after the Civil War, and he was called the Apothecary General. I can't think of his name off the top of my head. He was called the Apothecary General, and apothecary was the use of plants in medicine. That's all we had. And yes, indeed, they used cannabis oil on the battlefield. Yes, indeed. Greg, not only on the battlefield, but we used it in the, out on the prairie. I mean, you know, we it was being used continuously across the country, um, not just, a, a, and, you know, there were people who were literally enjoying, you know, a hemp cigarette, smoking that, where it had, you know, probably two and a half to three percent, you know, THC in it once activated. But, you know, they were literally just trying to deal with, you know, the mosquito bite from last night. I mean, come on, this was a tough time. People just, you don't know, remember, it's almost like they think, you know, hmm, people, most people alive today can't remember a time when America didn't have cars. We didn't have cars back then. You know, people were walking, you know, 20 miles a morning, you know, so it, it, it's really just a ridiculous that we don't think in terms of reason why it was outlawed and it was really only outlawed because of you know people like William Randolph Hearst and Charles DuPont who wanted to start the pharmaceutical industry and textiles and and Hearst who wanted to continue to chop down trees. Rockefeller's father was the first snake oil salesman. He took petroleum uh, jelly and put it in a jar and called it a, a miracle cure for everything and he was uh, persecuted for it. He was jailed for it. It's ironic isn't it? Absolutely. Well, now, besides being a full-time cannabis writer, you are actively developing Intelligent Informers Cannabis Television Program. Talk a little bit about some of the programming that you're working on. Yeah. Well, as I said earlier, my What's in Your Stash, um, that's being shopped right now in Los Angeles. 
and I'm very excited about it. And uh, my other series I write for Weed World UK called Weed Traveler, because I've traveled uh, in the cannabis space for several years. Um, that's been developed with uh, Max Montrose as the host. Uh, Max has traveled all over the world. Have you had him on yet, Max? From Max, the I'll have to reach out to him. You, you will you will love to have him on because he will say, you know, everyone talks about THC, but he's the, the whole terpene profile thing. But he's traveled all over the world. And I actually first developed that show for Anthony Bourdain because I took his concept of, you know, take the food away, put cannabis there, go to a place. You're talking about a sense of place, geography, history, culture around the plant. So that's I developed it for him. But now, you know, we lost him. God bless. And uh, so I redeveloped it for Max because he's he's like the science nerd of weed. He's, he screams for a show. I'm excited about that one. So those are the two right now that are being shot. Plus, I have a scripted series that I wrote um, with my writing partner, Renee Carley, in Los Angeles. It's called Canopolis, and it's based on a series I wrote for Dope Magazine. It's a fiction based on fact. It's really important to me. It's about my time in Humboldt and it, it profiles caregivers and farmers in real time as legalization is happening and their lives are changed forever. So that's a scripted series and um, I'm shopping that too. So I, none of my shows are stoner shows. I heard Jim Belushi on your show uh, say, you know, my, my farm show isn't a stoner show. We're really focusing on that now. We're really focusing on education and let's be real about this, you know. God bless Cheech and Chong, but, you know, stoner, the word stoner came from the alcohol culture. It has nothing to do with being high or lifted. Your endorphins are lifted when you smoke. It's not stoned. So the language needs to change. Absolutely. I think that's one of the misnomers. I think, again, you keep saying, you've said it over and over again, education is going to be the key to this, I think, as, as far as, you know, but it's not just educating, you know, the legislators, it's educating the masses. I mean, you know, most people still, right now, or there are some people that are still reluctant to even think about trying cannabis when it could be the answer to most of their issues. I know, I hear you. Well, what's next for, you know, uh, Sharon Letts? What's next? What's coming up? Well, hopefully television um, next year, you know, we'll really focus on that and hopefully that'll happen. Um, and I'll continue writing. I'll continue advocating. Um, I do my kitchen apothecary. I make my own medicines. I teach people how to make medicine because, you know, we all can't afford dispensaries. So that's another thing I do. If somebody wanted to find you, where do they go? I have a website, SharonLitz.com. My full cancer story is on there. Um, I'm high time. All my higher profile series and my what's in your stash series is online on high times. Weed World UK. If you just Google my name, there's just stories everywhere out there. One of my brands is called Educated Stoner, and I have a series of essays that's been printed globally in many languages, and uh, it's a basic thing about what I've gone through. I use myself as a guinea pig. I just rescued two dogs, and they're now cannabis patients. One of them was carried in near death, and she's doing great. So I use it in my own life, and then I write about it. Excellent. Well, I can't say thank you enough, Sharon, for being a part of Let's Be Blunt today. And look, thank you all for joining us today for another episode of Let's Be Blunt. And please remember to subscribe. And if you're watching on YouTube, then ring the bell and you'll get notified when one of our new podcasts are available. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your feedback. So make sure you send us a little note. Let us know. Give us some comments. Let us know how we're doing. I got to say thank you again to Sharon Let's. You can get a hold of Sharon. Go up on your your website, and then what article, if you were going to recommend one article, what would it be that they should read from you? Oh, gosh. Oh, my God, there's so many. Um, Olivia and John and John Easterling online and uh, Weed World UK, because she goes into cancer, they go into the formulations, they go into replacing opioids, very important right now. Absolutely. All right. Well, Sharon, thank you so much again. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel.